Uh, so Hannah, uh, she's been knitting since she was eight years old. She learned the craft from a neighbor who happened to also be a local sheep farmer. Ever since, she's been obsessed with everything that can be made with stick, string, fabric, fiber, and more. Her passion for beautiful functional crafting is something she loves to share with others. In, 2000, or in 2017, she released her first book, Slow Knitting, a statement to the knitting world about the philosophies and thoughts she's been having about how we make and how we create positive ripples in the communities and world around us through crafting. Slow Knitting outlined several tenets that she had carried into her everyday life as a knitter, designer, and writer. In October, she then released her second book, Seasonal Slow Knitting, which expands on the crafting practices that readers can explore throughout the year on an individual level with any budget or yarn stash. Anna believes it's fundamentally important to stand up for the things that we believe in and to fully incorporate practices of sustainability and environmental stewardship in our lives. Through her business and crafting processes, she does her best to showcase the beautiful diversity of the crafting community while also pledging her support for marginalized and minority members. You can find and follow Hannah on her social media pages and on her website with, it's an, it's an incredible one. So go check it out when you have time, hannahthyson.com. So go ahead, Hannah, whenever you're ready. All right, All right. thank you so much for that fantastic intro. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm Hannah, and I wrote some knitting books. I've been knitting for a while, quite a bit, um, since I was eight. Now I'm 33. I would say that I'm an advanced intermediate knitter in technique and skill level, but I believe that that's kind of what makes me special as an author is that I'm not super technical, and my goal is to meet everybody where they are and just help share this excitement of the thing that I love most, which is knitting and wool and fiber. So through kind of everything that I do, my goal is to just share the excitement and keep us all interested and engaged, but also have us thinking in new philosophical ways about our knitting practice beyond just what am I going to make next? Do I like this color of yarn? Because I think that once you start to believe that your craft can be a very holistic aspect of your life, then it becomes a therapy, a meditation, um, a moment for reflection, a rewarding process that at the end you get this beautiful object that you've also knit all of these emotions and thoughts into by having a more conscientious practice. So I didn't start out thinking this way. Definitely not. I began knitting because I had a neighbor who said that she wanted to teach me on Sunday afternoons. And so I would go to her house and knit and watch Pink Panther reruns and make cookies or dye yarn with Kool-Aid in a crock pot. It was just something fun for me to do as a kid. And my parents would send me there to get, get me out of their hair for a few hours every Sunday. And so as I began kind of getting deeper and deeper into the knitting itself, my teacher, Mary Hal Davis, said to me, oh, we really need to go and get you some nice yarn. So she had all this yarn that I had been using at her house, but it was just like bits and bobs from other things. She wasn't the type of person to really um, have a lot of yarn that she wanted to give away. She really liked everything that she had uh, deeply. So it was more attractive to her to take me for my first yarn store experience in um, Kentucky. And we went to a store and the first yarn that anyone ever bought me was two skeins of Noro crayon. Now, if um, any of you are familiar with this yarn, it is, oh, am I still there? Sorry, my camera blinked for a second. Okay. <laughs> um, this was the first yarn that anyone had ever gifted to me. And Noro crayon is made in Japan. The man who creates it, Isak Noro, is like an artist and he blends all these colors together and then they blend them on big machines to create these yarns that change colors. And they use a pretty rustic wool that some knitters love and some knitters don't love. But this yarn is a classic. It's like worse weight. It's good for anything and everything. It's got a nice texture to it. So I was instantly hooked. I'm all about color and texture and the wooly feeling of wool. And there was something about that combination for me, the wooden needles, this really woolly wool, great color, the environment that I was in, that everything just kind of came together and it formed this memory that has become 
a really integral part of who I am as a person. And as I moved through the rest of my life, middle school, high school, college, I carried knitting with me, but it was always just something that I sort of knew how to do, but I didn't really dive deep into it. I didn't make any big projects. I knit a couple hats. I knit maybe one, one or two sweaters and scarves. I tried knitting socks. I fell in love with knitting socks. And then around 2010, I started Ravelry. Ravelry had just started up, which is the kind of Facebook for knitters. It's a very specific website, just about knitting crochet. They have some weaving, I think on there as well and spinning projects. And I really fell in love with the community, getting to know other people who knit who were my age or a little bit older and they were online. They're excited to share what they were making and get other people excited about that. I really interested and hooked and excited about all of the community that surrounded making and craft because I lived somewhere that I didn't feel like there was anyone doing what I wanted to do. I didn't have too many people to talk to about it outside of my mom. You know, my mom knit, knew how to knit and then she kind of picked it back up as I started picking it back up and being more serious about it through Ravelry, I was able to make connections to all these different yarn companies and brands. So as a student in fashion school, I then turned that fashion school work into working on marketing, merchandising, product development, um, just anything and everything having to do with yarn or selling yarn or making yarn. I've done some part of it for all kinds of companies um, all over the world, subscription box companies, individual yarn companies, dyers, small scale indie dyers. So I've learned a lot along the way. And part of what I learned along the way was very much what I liked about knitting and then what I didn't like about knitting. And it all kind of came to a culmination for me in about 2015 when I was writing a blog post for a yarn store and they asked me, it was right before Christmas, And they asked me to write about holiday knitting in framed as January 1st. It was a January 1st delivery date for the blog. And I was writing it pre-Christmas. So if you knit or you craft or you make things for people at any time, you already know that your crafting time from pretty much the whole year um, has the potential to become crafting time for other people. It's very easy for crafters to make a lot of things that they love and then feel saturated and then want to make things for everybody else. I have never been super prolific and I kept trying to knit things for other people and coming up short, not hitting the deadline. It was a week before Christmas. I'm sitting in my bedroom. I'm re-seaming sleeves to my dad's Christmas sweater because I've put them in backwards. And I'm just like, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I so stressed out about a craft that is supposed to bring me joy? And so I started really thinking about for the article, what I wanted to do, where I was and where I wanted to be. And what I determined was that what I really wanted to do was slow down. I just wanted to step back, really appreciate the part that I love that magic that happened between needles, materials, pattern. And stop thinking about who I'm knitting for, how fast I can make it, how many I can crank out, 12 12 socks in 2012, 17 sweaters in 2017. It just felt like too much all the time. So I wrote the essay and I titled it An Argument for Slow Knitting. And it was the first time I had written about slow knitting. And I compared the concept to food concepts um, that kind of idea that if we want to taste what a carrot really is, like the essence of what a carrot is, you would plant the carrot and take care of the carrot. And you would care about the soil that the carrot is sitting in. And then when the carrot is removed from the soil, we care about how the carrot is cleaned and how the carrot is cooked to honor that ingredient. And I thought, why not do that with wool? That's how I feel about my knitting process. I want to know who's making the yarn. I want to know how the sheep or the other animals are cared for. I want to know the steps that it goes through from the time that that sheep or that alpaca or the angora bunny is shorn to the time that it reaches my yarn shop shelf. I want to know how far that distance is. 
I don't know if that had to travel all the way around the world to get to me or if it was in my backyard. And then once I know all those things, I feel informed and empowered and capable of making those next step decisions. So I knew that I, I needed to like pursue this idea in a much stronger way than just an occasional blog project. So I thought to myself, what do, what do people do when they have an idea and they want to share it with a lot of other people and they know that they need some help? <laughs> so I reached out to um, a publisher whose books that I really enjoyed, Abrams Press, Abrams Craft out of New York. And at the time they were STC, but it's not important. And I sent them this proposal and the proposal was the blog post, a little snippet of um, an explanation of what it was and a mood board. And I said, could I write a book? And I didn't know if I would get an answer. I'd read online that they're, you know, two months, three months before you even get a no sometimes from a publisher. And I certainly didn't expect for them to get back to me very quickly and say, yeah, we'd love for you to write this book. So I started writing the book in 2015, and then I sort of began to identify what were the practices of other knitters that I felt that I could better incorporate. I was meeting knitters who told me, oh, I've been knitting for 45 years, but I only knit one sweater a year. And I would go, how can you only knit one sweater a year? Because they pick a garment that they know they need in their wardrobe, they pick a garment that they're going to enjoy every stitch of the process. They pick a material that they're very excited to work with. And then they just let it take the time it takes. They don't feel rushed through the process. And for me, that's, that was a foreign concept. I also met other knitters who told me they save up all of their yarn and stash money for one purchase a year at a yarn festival. They just save it all up and then they go one time a year and they buy all their yarn for the year. And I was like, how do you know? How do you know what yarn you need for a year? So these questions kind of drove me to answer those questions with slow knitting answers, answers that I had to write for myself. And then that I hoped I could share with other people. So the first book, Slow Knitting, is um, a series of essays and then it's combined with patterns and projects and a few other essays from other people, but patterns and projects designed by some of the knitting industry's kind of like biggest names at the time. So Nora Gaughan has a piece in the book, Julia Farwell Clay, Veronique Avery, who is from Quebec. She's a um, Quebec-based designer. It kind of highlighted all these different yarn companies that I felt like were really great and doing it right in the sense that they allowed me to trace everything they were using back to the source. Um, I felt very confident when I put out this book that this is, this is it. This is the one book that I'm going to write and it's going to be awesome. And all of these patterns are really exciting because they're from people who are not me, who are super talented. And the book went out in the world and it was very well received. People enjoyed it. And then I started thinking about some of the things that people were giving me feedback on. The first book didn't have patterns that were designed by me. I was too nervous to design the patterns. So I thought I could design the patterns for the second book. The first book didn't have a lot of um, ideas for how you could take these slow knitting practices and then incorporate them into your life. And that's a lot of what the second book is. So they really do go, go together in the sense that one is the building block and the next one is the expansion. But they each kind of contain different pieces of who I am as an author, who I as, am as a knitter. Um, pieces of my soul that I get to share with you guys through words on a page. So I thought that I would start today by reading you guys one of these pieces of my soul that I put on a page. I'm going to read from page 71 of the original slow knitting book. Let me find that page. And I'm reading an essay called Think Environmentally. So for anyone who hasn't seen these books in person, I think that what's really special, what I like to hope is really special about my books is that I care a lot about visual imagery and I spend a lot of time figuring out how to best communicate an idea or thought through a picture to all of my readers. So throughout each of the books, there are big full, full page photographs. There's spreads that are you know, meticulously arranged 
um, prop displays, for lack of a better word. There's all of these little tiny pieces that I sort of pulled together for you guys visually. And so I hope that as people go through the book, they'll go through the book more than once and look at those photos really carefully. Because to me, a great book, especially a book like for your knitting practice or for crafting, should be inspirational beyond just the words. So I really wanted all of the pictures to be super inspirational. Chapter three in slow knitting, um, which is what I'm reading from, opens with think environmentally, which is one of the tenets of slow knitting. So in slow knitting, we have um, five tenets. The first is source carefully, produce thoughtfully, think environmentally, experiment fearlessly, and explore openly. So I go into each of those in the first book and discuss what they mean and how I've interpreted those phrases and how we can kind of implement them. So think environmentally is just one of those tenets. Embracing the seasonality of our craft is as much a part of slow knitting as anything else. As the availability of our materials changes throughout the year, so does our role as knitters. Working in harmony with the seasonal cycle helps us feel our place in nature's ebb and flow. Spring and summer teach us to collect and explore the bounty of what is around us and to prepare for the turn indoors in fall and winter, where we will set ourselves about keeping warm and making use of what we've gathered. In the end, it all comes down to working with nature, plant, or animal. In autumn, crafters make pilgrimage in mass to fiber festivals and wool shops to stock up for winter projects. This is the best time of year to be a knitter. The leaves are changing and the warmth of late year sunshine softens the chilly damp breath of winter. Woolen things of past years make their way back into our wardrobes, pulled out of storage to warm fingers and toes. And as we gather them up, we revive our memories of their making. New knitters are born in yarn shops or the homes of friends where they will learn the ritual of beginning. If fall is our origin season, winter is the apex. We comfort ourselves and those around us by gathering in warmly lit rooms, picking up knitting and nesting in deep cozy afghans and handmade pullovers. Southern winters are short and kind, while their northern cousins are different and cold. This indifference somehow makes you hardier as if the cold reminds you that you are a tender living being. These true winters reach deep into your bones and rattle them. Each breath yields a startling sensation of living. Some part of me always misses the chill of the Midwestern winters of Iowa. Although I've relocated, I still sniff the air on the coldest days to see if snow is coming. You can tell by the lack of humidity and the stillness. I love seeing fat, fluffy flakes falling outside while I sit in a favorite chair with my spinning wheel whirring or needles clicking. Spring and summer bring with them new growth and welcome us outside. Oppressive heat tends to settle in Tennessee, my current home, during the summer months, making knitting uncomfortable without the aid of air conditioning. I have heard and said many times that the warmer seasons are for smaller projects, blanket squares, socks, baby things. But the truth is that summer is for being outdoors, to explore and renew our souls through sunshine, glittering water, deep woods. While I cannot imagine putting down my knitting for half of the year, I find that my knitting bookends my day rather than engulfs it. I plod along on existing projects as the mood strikes. It is important as a slow knitter to embrace this seasonal change and celebrate rather than fight it. These months give me time to dream about the projects I wanna begin and start seeking out their materials. The onslaught of warmer weather is not a knitting down season, but a season of inspiration. This turn indoors, outdoors, allows us to explore our craft in a new way, to delve into the abundance of nature and to prepare our stock for the later portion of the year. I seek to memorize the colors in tiny blooms and magnificent sunsets and store them for later use in projects that will bring me a breath of life in the cold and echoing winter. It is through this exploration of abundance that textile lovers in centuries past discovered the world of natural dyeing. The idea of going out and collecting natural dye stuff each season is enchanting. What a perfect way to extend our love of textiles into warmer months while also experiencing nature fully. Through the exploration and study of plants and natural dyes, 
we gain a deeper understanding of the world around us and what it has to offer. The materials and castoffs from our kitchen and gardens can be used to create a dazzling array of color for our knitted creations from humble onion skins to marigolds. Frequently in these warm months, mason jars find themselves seated on my windowsill, yarn floating within like anatomical specimens suspended in hues of amber. The best part of working with naturally dyed fibers is the feeling that comes with starting a project in yarn with so many facets. With naturally dyed wools, sometimes I can even take the time to wind the ball painstakingly by hand, placing the price gain in a deep hand-thrown ceramic yarn bowl and absorbing myself in the initial cast on. Using wooden needles somehow completes the effect, helping me reach back through the collective textile history of people doing the same thing so many years ago and hoping for the same results. Beautiful wearable garments that keep me warm in fall and winter until the spring blooms again. There are many people who've made natural dye in the center of their craft, producing beautiful naturally dyed yarns and fabrics that can that add, that any can appreciate and take home. I was like, what did I write? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With a better understanding of what they're doing, we come armed to the yarn store festival stand, ready to appreciate the unusual green, the deep indigo blue, the cochineal magenta, because we know the story of how they came to be. While it may not be feasible to add a full selection of mordants, alums, apothecary jars, cauldrons to your worldly possessions, it is always possible to appreciate what the environment around us provides and to eagerly await the next season for all that it brings. So I really wanted to read this one today because I feel that it's so perfect. We're right now on the cusp of spring. And also this essay for me was really the impetus essay for the second book for seasonal slow knitting, because it's all about embracing the change of each season and being okay with not focusing on a particular thing being okay to live in the moment, not feeling the pressure to finish anything or rush through a project or assign it out. If I don't want to knit a sweater in July, I'm not going to knit a sweater in July. I'm going to wait. And I think that everyone should feel free to do that. But as knitters, a lot of the time we put pressure on ourselves. If I knit it now, I'll have it for winter. If I knit it now, I have it to gift. And if you are driven very strongly in your practice by giving to others, then maybe that's okay for you. But for me, I get the most joy when I reserve my knitting for myself and I keep it something personal to me. So with seasonal slow knitting, I wanted to write a book that was like a farmer's almanac for knitters. So when I pitched this, I told them I want to do a farmer's almanac, but for knitting. I want it to have a lot of pictures and I want to divide it into four sections, one for each season, but I don't want to call them spring, summer, winter, fall. I want to go by the equinox and the solstice because I feel that these longer days, shorter days, the change of the light, the change of the season is more integral to our human being than whatever's on a clock or calendar. So for me, a lot of my practice is getting back in tune with the things around me, with the world that I live in, with the space that I exist in, because only through that can I really begin to focus on the part of me that isn't running around with all the rest of it, that isn't influenced by the rest of it. And that's my mind and my heart and my soul. So if I can become at one with the space around me, then I have more time to think introspectively. So with Everything that I'm doing now, I'm trying to be more conscientious of where we are seasonally, what's available, and how it's affected by the season somewhere else. I think that a lot of us are very used to, if we wake up one morning and we say, I would like a strawberry, we can go to the grocery store and buy a strawberry. Even if that strawberry doesn't taste good, it's available. And... I would rather never taste a strawberry that doesn't taste like a strawberry, but that requires some level of us telling ourselves no. So a lot of slow knitting is about telling yourself, no, no, I don't have to, no, I don't want to, no, I don't feel like it. I do a lot of telling myself no nowadays. It's about learning this deeper appreciation for that scarcity 
And through that deeper appreciation, you're going to make yourself full. You're going to make it so that you don't have the fear of missing out. If you can become really satisfied with the knitting process or searching out and learning about a particular yarn, you're adding time to every project for doing this. And by adding that time, you begin to really respect the project that you've chosen. And you don't feel as inclined to start something else or run away with some new yarn because you've already invested the time. It's like any other relationship. If you put a lot of time into building it, you're not as quick to just let it go. So if you spend a lot of time in developing your relationship to the materials and the project, you're not as quick to cast on something new and you're not as quick to buy everything that's brand new off the shelf either. So if anyone watching this is like, what I need to do is slow down on buying yarn, you're not alone. (laughs) (laughs) I actually just taught a class last month about um, stashing and organizing stash and figuring out where your stash is headed. And a lot of knitters just buy things because we see it and we're excited and it's pretty and it's available. And then we get at home and we're like, oh, I've got four and they're already all that color. So by thinking about everything in this really full holistic way and taking the time and training yourself to really drag out this process a little bit longer and to enjoy it, I think that you really make yourself fear of missing out proof. Seasonal slow knitting has a lot of little elements that have been taken from my entire knitting practice and then put in this book. I think what makes it unusual as a knitting book is how not every idea that I present is the best way of doing something. A lot of writers, I think, like to put something in text that they're sure is foolproof. It's very scary to put something in print that you feel could have variable results or make people feel as if they didn't pay enough attention, if they don't get the same results as you. But not always is every knitter in a place to do something in the best possible way. For example, I have a whole section on blocking in the book. Blocking for anyone who's watching and doesn't knit is when you take a sweater or garment that you finished and you soak it in water to make all of the wool fluff up and get real pretty again. And then you take it out of the water and you dry it. And when you dry it, you dry it flat and you pin it out to the specific measurements of what you're making. And blocking traditionally is done a variety of different ways. But one of the most standard is to have these really nice foam blocking mats and T-pens and like pin out all of your pieces and lay it flat on a bed or a floor where it can dry overnight or for a couple of days. Um, I lived in an apartment until last year. I don't think I've ever had the space to lay out a garment on the floor. I've only ever had one bed in my space, so I couldn't lay it out on the bed. And so I invented all these kind of like little ways that I could do it without it being so hard. I thought, why not just pin everything to a towel and hang the towel over the shower bar? Or why not only steam block some items? Or why not wear block some items? So I introduced some of these concepts in different sections of slow knitting that are not necessarily proven best method concepts, but they're, it might work for your right now concepts. And I think that's something that sets this book apart. Another thing that's really special for me is that I um, wrote all the patterns for this book. So I don't like to call myself a designer. I guess I am now, whether I want to be or not. But I've never set out in my career to be a knitting designer. I think there are a lot of people who are very, very talented in that area. And they know everything technical that you need to know. And they know how to make it perfect. Luckily, I had one of them working with me on this book. So she could take my hand scratch notes and turn them into a pattern, which is great. I'm getting better. But um, in this book, I have patterns that I wrote. And then I divided them up by season. And one of the ones that I want to show you guys is the coffee hour pullover. So this is just a pretty simple pullover. It's yoked. It has um, kind of a stand-up collar, some linen stitch elements, and it uses peace fleece, which is a super fluffy yarn that blends um, wools from uh, Ohio and Texas with 
yarns from the Lakota and Dakota and Navajo tribes is my understanding. And then it allows them to buy the wool buy every year for the Navajo. So they're able to buy yarn from the Navajo or buy wool from the Navajo nation for this yarn, which is really great because it provides a market for that tribe. Um, Peace fleece is dyed and milled at, at Harrisville in New Hampshire, which is kind of the other end of the continent from y'all. Mm -hmm. But it is very cool. If you ever get out to New Hampshire, you should definitely stop by. I, in each section, I talk in depth about the yarn that is used. So the beginning of each pattern has a big section on the yarn that is used. And then I have, you know, your standard stuff, sizes, finish measurements, info about the yarn. But then I've added this whole section called alternative yarns. What I really wanted to do with these alternative yarns was provide opportunities for knitters who are around the world to find something more local to them. So for example, you guys are on the other side of the continent from um, Harrisville. So you could order and it would probably ship, you know, a couple of weeks, but why not use a Canadian yarn instead? So for this yarn in the alternative yarns, I have Briggs and Little Heritage, which is a Canadian yarn. It's hundred percent wool. And it is, don't remember where it's made. If anyone knows and wants to drop it in the comments, please do. But there are different recommendations kind of throughout the entire book for yarns that you can swap in, give you an idea. Maybe if you know one of the yarns I mentioned, then you'll be able to take that knowledge that you've already developed as an editor and say, oh, that yarn is like this yarn that I, that I know about. So you can kind of plug and play with this a little bit more maybe than a traditional pattern would lay out. I also try to have a really casual writing voice with the patterns because I don't want it to be confusing. I think it's very easy for patterns to get very confusing. So I try to keep it kind of chill, make it easy, give tips, um, and flow through each pattern in a really, a really casual way that would allow you to move through it seasonally. So I'm gonna, what time are we at? Okay, 20 to three. All right. I'm going to close by reading this little um, piece from seasonal slow knitting. And then I thought I would kind of open it up for the question and answer for the last you know, 10, 20 minutes, uh, 15 minutes ish. All right. I'm going to read this one called new shoots. So this is from the spring chapter, the spring equinox chapter. It's on page 57 and it's called new shoots. Slide the first stitch, wrap, and repeat. The project grows and we grow with it. A climb and an expansion that reflects the deliberate but intentional movements of Ivy and Bougainvillea. I once watched a time-lapse video of Pothos rotating throughout the day, seeking a foothold to climb upward. In the same way, our yarn and our fingers move in search of the next stitch the yarn over, down and up again through the loop ritual of making fabric in thin air. There's a magic, a meditative mood that we reach when we give our moments over to making. Depending on the project, I have found myself absorbed for hours that feel like minutes or for a precious dedicated half hour that feels like an infinite afternoon. The incantation of a stitch pattern emerges through quiet mental repetition. The resulting fabric grows and reaches out from my hands, whirring instruments of my casting fingers bringing it into being. Light in all forms brings life to delicate planted seeds, and it also brings life and presence into the practice of making. Morning sunlight, a moment stolen beside the steaming coffee cup in the early quiet. Golden afternoon light spilling in from every window, that slowly fades and is replaced by the flickering glow of a candle and the warm illumination of a yellowed lampshade. What we make is the culmination of a seed planted in our minds. Our projects for those who wear them are like herbal remedies. We gather these moments, this light, these finished objects around us in the same way that we gather bundles of fresh wildflowers, knowing they cannot last forever, they will fade with time, but enjoying every moment they're here with us. 
And in the same way, I'm really honored to be here with you guys today. So I'd really like to open up for any questions that anybody might have or any expanding that I could do. Perfect. Thank you so much for speaking. That was, it was beautiful. And uh, I mentioned that I'm not a knitter myself, but I think you, you mentioned several things, especially living in the moment. And I think at this period of time, when we're experiencing all that we are, it definitely gives us reflection, not just on our knitting and crafting practices, but on many aspects of our life. And I think you just had a really beautiful way to say that. So um, we'll you. see if anybody's got some questions, just drop them into the Q&A down at the bottom. Um, I guess for myself, uh, not everybody's probably had a chance to see your second book. So what would you recommend for spring projects as we're coming up to yeah. the new season? So in the spring section of the book, the spring equinox section, um, I have a couple projects. The first is the Seeds and Stems Cowl. It is a single or double loop lace cowl. The charts are not too bad, I promise. If you're reading and you're terrified of charts, here's the charts, they're not too bad, I promise. Mm -hmm. You can do it. I did it, which means you guys can do it because I'm really bad at knitting lace and I even designed this guy. <laughs> it is so pretty. It uses this um, fantastic kind of like two-ply Cormo wool from Dresel Family Farm here in the US, but a really similar yarn might be from um, beaver slide, which is kind of an on the border mill in, I think they're in Montana. They could be in Wyoming, but they make some wonderful yarns. that would be great in here or anything that's really round. If you've got some sock yarn in your stash, it's a good one. Another thing that you could make from the spring chapter would be these swatch sachets. So swatches are something that all knitters do. You're supposed to do them anyway, to make sure that all your garments are fitting you knit a little swatch that has so many stitches and so many rows, and then you count how many stitches and rows per inch. And that's like your ruler for the whole piece that you're making. But what happens is that you end up with a lot of these kind of floating around your house. <laughs> so, especially if, if you occasionally design things. And so I have so many of them. So I started sewing them up the sides, taking two that are the same size, sewing them up the sides, stuffing them, and then putting a little lavender or essential oil, some cedar chips in there as a form of moth repellent. Um, there's a lot of writing stuff in all of the chapters. So the book is a lot of stuff to read. It's just not, not just knitting and not just these sewing projects, but spring does have more sewing projects because that's when I like to sew. So this is a circular needle um, storage piece. And then there's two baby blankets in this chapter as well. Some really squishy ones. Uh, let's see if I can find a bigger photo for you. Here we go. Perfect for gifting because who doesn't know someone who's gonna have a baby in the spring, in the summer, just feel like all the babies come that time of year. So it's good to have a couple projects ready to go. So that is probably what I would knit for spring, but really a lot of, I mean, a lot of the patterns in here, I think you could just start them whenever you want. No pressure, no rules. Excellent. We have Tamara asking, what are you working on right now? Okay. So Tamara, I am knitting the remain. I don't have anything, you know, right here that I could grab and show you but I am knitting the last sleeve and the top yoke of failing, which is a new sweater out from Emily green. And I am knitting a new pattern that will be in the holiday issue an upcoming holiday issue of Vogue knitting out of wool folk flat, which is a boucle made with hundred percent wool. And they use this wool called Ovis 21, which is like the softest Merino in the, in the world. So this thing is so wonderful to knit. I just spend all day like knitting a few rows and then snuggling with it and then knitting a few rows and snuggling with it. But right now I have to kind of keep everything hidden because I have a kitten and she wants to eat all my things. And she has very sharp little teeth that just <laughs> clip right through my project if I'm not careful. So I have to keep everything hidden. Perfect. Uh, Chanel asks, do you have a knitting podcast? I don't have a knitting podcast. I'll be honest, I, um, 
I find my voice a little shrill recorded. No, no. So wonderful. when I, oh, thank you, but I don't really like hearing myself play back. And I think for a podcast, it's kind of something that you have to do. So I haven't, I've avoided it. I should, I should do it. It would be fun. I should do it because it would be fun, but, but I have probably, not. You've probably hmm? been on several podcasts and episodes. Yes. Right? Yes. I've been on the, um, the Christy glass show. I've been on the webs podcast. I've been on be hooked, which is a great podcast. Been on the Tolt yarn hour. I think that's what it's called. I was on the cheers to you podcast or video blog show. So yeah, I've been very lucky to be asked to speak for a lot of, um, podcasts and people and events. And I really, really miss that the most probably out of my whole job, I miss being able to travel and talk to knitters face to face. Like it would be so great to be at the library with you guys and talk to you. That would be a dream because I love going and meeting people. I think that's the best part. For sure. Uh, Chanel also asks, do you have any favorite knit designs? Yes. Yes. I really love um, maybe not knit knit design specific ones. I have a couple garments that I've knit that I really love. I have a Technicolor dream sweater that I knit by, it's a pattern by Stephen West. And it's, the pattern itself is not what I knit. <laughs> it's the pattern is like a little cropped thing with stripes and then it's got dangly bits, but I knit it with a much longer body and it has a very low dip in the back. And I wear that sweater all the time. If you'd like to see it, I have pictures on my website and also on Ravelry. Um, I love that. I love that sweater. Something that I recently finished that I really like and really enjoyed was knitting Ellen Mason's pattern, Rindy Jane. Rindy Jane is a plain stockinette raglan sweater. You can kind of modify it however you want. It has a Henley neck opening and she offers a color work option for the bottom band. But what I love about it is it's available in like five gauge options and then a bunch of sizes. And she presents it as a nested PDF. So you can kind of remove all the sizes you don't want and just read the sizes you do. It makes it a sort of different knitting experience. And then today I am swatching for Lucky Pieces, which is a new pattern from Pom Pom Quarterly, the new one that just came out, the quilting issue. It's the one on the cover. And I've never tried entrelock before. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not the most advanced knitter, you know. I'm probably just like every other knitter, you know. And that's I think what makes um, makes it easier for me to connect with with just everybody. Mm -hmm. So this one's entrelock, which I haven't tried, and it's really hard. And you kind of knit these little pieces, and you go back the other way and pick up a whole bunch of things and knit backwards, and it's confusing. But I'm enjoying the puzzle of it. I don't typically do anything really you know, mentally challenging other than math when I'm designing a pattern. And so it's fun to do something that's more physically, you know, meticulous, very different from the kind of design work that I do. For sure. Uh, Tamara also asks, what's your favorite natural dye to use? Oh gosh, that's a really hard, Tamara, you're like hitting me with these questions. Um, the fit, my favorite natural dye right now, I'm really obsessed with Sequoia. I got Sequoia from um, Mewa, which is a, just an amazing natural dye studio in, I think they're in Toronto. Is Toronto the one on, is Vancouver and Toronto, are those the same? Opposite. Opposite. Okay. It's the one on your all side. <laughs> the one above Portland, Oregon and Seattle and all that. Of Vancouver, the city? Yeah. yeah I think that's where they're at. Mewa. May what it could be. I could have it wrong. I'm sorry if I have it wrong. Canada's a big place. <laughs> um, but Maywa is fantastic and they have so many beautiful natural dyes. And I got Sequoia from them and it makes this brown that's almost purple. And if you add a little iron to it, it goes really dark purple and you get these kind of very moody colors. And that's totally my vibe. If it looks like it's, you know, been rolled around outside for a while, I want it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is it a dirty color? Give it to me. <laughs> we have Marianne just saying, uh, Maywa has amazing stuff. So uh, we yes. also have Gloria asking, do you have a favorite brand of knitting needles? So I am not brand loyal, 
I have pretty much every brand in my in my house. I really love the old style Addy Turbo needles that were nickel plated. And I just love the sound that they make and how smooth they are. And I really, really miss them. Um, I buy them off of eBay a lot. When I see them come up, I'll just buy some off eBay or if they show up in someone's, you know, estate sale or something. Um, for wooden needles right now, I'm really loving the Likey needle set, L-Y-K-K-E which comes as like an interchangeable set. And for ease of use, I love interchangeable needles, but I also have nitpicks needles that I use a lot. Knitter's pride needles, clover. I've been having some clover here. I've got, um, some Chiaogu needles. I'm not sure if I said that right. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that there's so many great knitting needles, just trying a bunch and deciding what you like personally is, is the best practice, but I would really highly recommend looking at, um, wood needles, birch needles from Brittany, which is a U.S. maker, Indian Lake Artisans, if you all want to get fancy and try some really um, craftsman made needles or diet craft, which is like the gold standard of circulars. Um, I've also tried signatures. I find them a bit, I don't really knit with a lot of metal needles unless they're those nickel plated for some reason. I just don't enjoy them as much. For sure. Uh, a question for myself is, is that you've talked about saying no and uh, knowing when to say no. So do you have any of those projects you started and then you just said, nope, not finishing it? Definitely. Yeah, there's probably some hiding in this cabinet. <laughs> um, I say no all the time. I get I get started on something. And I'm like, this is not holding my attention. And I'll just unravel it, put the yarn away and come back to it later if if it recaptures me. If I think that a project is giving me a lot of trouble, I'll put it in timeout. I do not hesitate. <laughs> I have better things to do. Everybody has better things to do than to ag agonize and have stress over your knitting project. So um, if it's bringing you stress, send it to timeout and go back and get it later when it stops. And I just spend some time every year and I do write about this in the book. I go through everything. I go through all my cabinets, all my stash. I do a big spring clean. And that helps me kind of clear out the projects that are lingering and malingering in the stash. And I guess where, are, where's your future heading? What do you have on the go? What's, what's coming down? Yeah. The so I, I always have something going on. I'm a horrible over committer. So I, despite saying no frequently, I just overload myself with commitments. So I've got um, some classes and things that I'm working on. I'm working on a book proposal workshop project. I get a lot of questions from other people, other crafters who are interested in writing a book of their own and they aren't really sure where to start. So I'm going to try to build something for them. Um, it will be a cross craftual workshop. So if you're like a quilter or um, crocheter, you could still find it useful. So that's something I'm working on. I've got some designs in the works. I have a few that will be independently published, hopefully near the end of the year. I work part-time as production editor for a publication out of Oregon called By Hand Serial. It's a travel and crafting magazine. And I am developing a whole new business right now that I can't talk about too much, sure. but it's been keeping me really busy. It's like doing a startup. So um, as far as future books go, I have three or four ideas. They're in proposal development, but they're not really ready to share with the world yet. But I'm hoping soon I'll be able to send them to the publisher and then I'll have a better idea of when another slow knitting book or a book that feels totally different will come out. For sure. Well, it sounds like you enjoy staying busy. You thrive in that. Um, I do. You're not slowing down. And I'm sure that whenever those books are available, we've got a wonderful audience here that will uh, check them out and enjoy them. So thank you so much, Hannah. We really thank appreciate you. you joining us here in Southern Alberta today. Um, for everyone else, thank you so much for joining us and giving this uh, Zoom presentation a try. I know sometimes we are feeling a little fatigued and now that the weather's turning, we wanna get out and enjoy the sunshine. So I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, I will be sending out an evaluation form. I would appreciate it if you could take a moment just to, you know, do the couple of clicks to answer. It really helps us figure out what we should be doing for programming here at the library and shows that what we're doing is valued. So 
please take a chance to do that if you have it, uh, if you have a moment or two. Um, and yeah, just wanting to let everybody know we are reopening to the public on March 17th. I believe that's Wednesday in a limited capacity. Um, you can come in, use the computer for 45 minute sessions or come through uh, the doors just to do your pickup holds. We are also loaning out Chromebooks and Wi-Fi hotspots to people with library cards now. So if you need that or know somebody that could benefit, please let them know. Um, we're always happy to help and try to do it with whatever we can to connect people with resources in our community, especially right now with everything going on. So we thank you. Our attendees are thanking you on the chat, Hannah. And oh, thank Tom. you so much. Just thank you, everybody. And I hope you have a lovely weekend. Take care. Thank you. I'm so honored to have been here. Thank you, guys. Take care, Hannah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.